have us good morning the scripture is romans 9 17 17 through 29 Yes, do I need the large print? I know I'm getting old. <laughs> it's okay. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the, the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did say to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared before, beforehand for glory. Even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that, he will, that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left to, his, to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and, we, and would have resembled Gomor, excuse me, Gomorrah. May God have a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Karen. Beginner Church is dismissed. In this section of Romans, we're in a pretty intense discussion of the sovereignty of God. Paul's clear point is that God is sovereign. He uses as an example of God's sovereignty, Pharaoh. And it's an interesting study in, in the sovereignty of God. And I'll, I'll show you in just a second. In verse 17, it says, the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Now, Pharaoh might have thought that all the power was his, but he had another thought coming, didn't he? In Exodus, we see a power encounter between God and Pharaoh as God begins to bring plagues on Egypt. The first few plagues, the tagline is, so Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it changes just ever so slightly, but it does change. As we get into chapter 9, after the livestock have died, the plague of boils comes. And this time, it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And throughout the rest of the plagues, it's God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, what happened? God just uses the raw material that is given to him. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. 
Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it explains why in what we read as our call to worship in verse 16. <coughs> it says, but I, indeed for this reason I've allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. But as Pharaoh's heart was already hardened, God took that and used it for his purposes, for his glory, to free his people who were slaves in Egypt. To proclaim his name. Who's going to get the glory? All the earth will be filled with my glory, declares the Lord. Throughout all the rest of the plagues, God demonstrates his glory until the final plague where the firstborn in all of Egypt die. Paul says, God has mercy as he desires. Is that fair? Some people think, no, that's not fair. Some people think we're nothing but puppets on this earth. God's pulling the strings and we react. That's not what scripture says. That's not who we are. But Paul does say, then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Just as with Pharaoh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart because that's what he had to work with. Did, have Pharaoh, did Pharaoh have opportunities to change his mind? Sure he did. He had 10 opportunities to change his mind. Did he change his mind? No, he did not. So God uses that for his glory to free his people, to free the Israelites. And, and Paul becomes the devil's advocate here in verse 19, which says, you'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? If God is in charge, if God is the sovereign God, why does he still find fault? If we have no choice, ah, but we do, don't we? There, there's, a, there's a paradox here. They just have to, you have to accept the fact that both things are true if you're going to understand this. God is sovereign, but within his sovereignty, we are free to act as we will. And he'll use our actions for his glory, for his purposes. He's more than willing to use our free will to show mercy. And he does over and over again. Remember last week in Peter, we read, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do all come to repentance? Does God force them? No. The story of the rich young ruler demonstrates this so clearly. Because he comes to Jesus, he wants to know how to be saved. How do I, how do I get to heaven? Jesus tells him, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. First he tells him to, com to, to obey the first or the last of the commandments. And then he says, the first four commandments have to do with this. Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. That's the heart of the matter. And it says he was very sad because he was very rich. So he can't do it. Does Jesus follow him down the road? Say, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> can, can we come up with another solution here? Can we, what about sell half of what you have and follow me for a little while, see how you like it, and then do whatever you want. No, the offer is there, and it's real, and it's merciful. The most merciful thing that Jesus offers is come and follow me, but he can't do it. But Jesus doesn't force him. He doesn't beg him. He doesn't tie him up and say, you're going to follow me. He lets him go, and that too is mercy. He gives him the freedom not to follow him. Who resists his will? Many people. On the contrary, <laughs> this, is, this is Rabbi Paul at his best. Who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Ever been to Pottery Barn? Not one of those pieces on the shelves said, God, I don't like what I am. Make me something else. 
And he uses kind of an interesting illustration here. Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use, let's say for a kitchen in implement, another for common use, let's say a commode. Same clay, different use. Would you use a commode in your kitchen? In an emergency, maybe, but <laughs> you would use it for what a commode is made for, which is not for cooking. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath pre prepared for destruction? Think of the history of the people of Israel. Think of how many times God sends prophets into Israel to tell them, return to the Lord. Come back. Come, we'll start all over, but come back. Return to me. And they don't. And he sends another prophet. We'll look at two of them this morning. Same message. Return to me. All you have to do is just return to me. You got to change your evil ways, baby. And just, just return to me. And all this forgiven. And when they did, he forgave. That's mercy, folks. Over and over and over again. He did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. He's talking to a mixed audience, isn't he, in Rome? There's a lot of Jewish believers there. There's a lot of Gentile believers there. In the book of Job, Job has some really interesting friends. They all have an idea of why Job is suffering. Every one of them has an idea. And they're all wrong. <laughs> Even Job has an idea. And he's wrong. He tries to defend himself. I haven't done anything wrong. That's probably true. But then finally God speaks. And li listen just for a moment to Psalm, uh, chapter 38 of, Psalm, of uh, Job. Then the Lord answered. He listened to all of these arguments for all this time, all of Job's friends, even Elihu. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. He lets them all speak. And here's his opening line. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You know, what's he saying? He's saying, all you guys who think you know what's going on here, who are you? Who do you think you are? Now gird up your loins like a man. Put on your jock strap because we're going to battle. And I'll ask you, and you instruct me. Very, very sarcastic here. This is God. But he's very facetious. He's very sarcastic. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? These are good questions that God asks, right? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know. <laughs> or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Where were you? Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud, its garment, and thick darkness, its swaddling bands, and I placed boundaries on it. And I set a bolt and doors, and I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. I was listening to, um, I forget which meteorologist it was. This, oh, it was on ABC, but anyway. She thought she said, I can predict the weather. I can tell you what's going to happen. I can't do anything about it. <laughs> Finally, somebody admitted that. Some meteorologist admitted, I have no control over the weather. And she kind of said, well, I wish I did. And I'm thinking, no, you don't. <laughs> nah, you don't want that. But God's saying the same thing. You don't have control over all these things. You do all the rain dances you want. It ain't going to happen. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? Do you decide what time the sun comes up? That's what he's saying. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. 
Is it changed? It is changed like clay under the seal, and they stand forth like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and the uplifted arm is broken. Have you ever, have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. This is God in the face of Job and his, the folks who were there to comfort him, Job's comforter, small comfort. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place that you may take it to its ter territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. This is God having fun with these guys. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail which I have reserved for the time of distress for the day of war and battle? Where is the way that the light is divided or the east wind scattered on the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people on a desert without a man in it to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven? Who has given it birth? Water becomes hard like stone, and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth const a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clouds stick together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair? Who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry to God and wander about? without food do you know the time of the mountain goat that, that the mountain goats give birth do you observe the calving of the deer can you count the months they fulfill or do you know the time of th they give birth they kneel down they bring forth their young they get rid of their labor pains their offspring become strong they grow up in the open field they leave and do not return to them who sent out the wild donkey free and who loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I gave the wilderness for a home and the salt land for his dwelling place getting an idea that this is a powerful God that's in charge and the salt land for its dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city, the shoutings of the driver he does not hear. He explores the mountains for his pasture and searches after every green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you or will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in a furrow with ropes or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you trust him because his strength is great and leave your labor to him? Will you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it from your threshing floor? The ostrich's wings flap joyously with the pinion and plumage of love, for she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust, and she forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not her own. Though her labor be in vain, she is unconcerned because God has made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding. When she lifts herself on high, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed and does not turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the flashing spear and the javelin with shaking and rage. He races over the ground, but he does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, aha, and he scents the battle from afar and the thunder of the captains and the war cry. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the cliff he dwells and lodges upon the rocky crag an inaccessible place. From there he spies out food. His eyes see it from afar. His young ones also suck up blood. And where the slain star are, there he is. And then the Lord says to Job, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Who are you, O oh man? 
Does the potter, does the clay say to the potter, why have you made me thus? Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. What's Job saying? Well, I'll shut up now. <laughs> I, I got nothing. God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He, he has no obligation to answer our questions, does he? We wish he would, and sometimes he does, but he's under no obligation. As far as that goes, he has no obligation to redeem us, does he? He could have just, poof, you're done. Could have flooded the earth again. He promised he wouldn't. Could have. But see, he has a divine plan that Paul has been talking about all through Romans, hasn't he? To redeem us, to buy us back, to call us to come home through Jesus. It's all part of his plan. Because some reject the plan doesn't mean the plan's no good. The plan is incredibly, incredibly good. The plan is Jesus. And his plan, as Paul is explaining to the crowd in Rome, includes the Gentiles. It started out with one nation, a difficult nation, to show mercy to. And it starts out with them and it continues over and over and over again to show mercy to them. And then he expands that to the Gentiles as we get into the Gospels. In Hosea, it's clear what we read earlier. Verse 23 of chapter 2 says, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who have not obtained compassion and I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. That's God's plan. Over in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. You remember Hosea had this very interesting call from God. Go, go take yourself a wife of harlotry. Go marry a, a whore, basically, is what he's telling him. And have children. So he takes Gomer. And she has children. First daughter is Lo Ruhama which means I will no longer have compassion. And then she has a son, Lo-Ami, which means you're not my people. But then God changes that by his great mercy. He tells the people, you are my people, and those who are not my people will be my people, and I will be your God. You will call me your God. And he did it. And he does it. Continues to do it. Continues to reach out in mercy and grace. The thing that the people of Israel missed was God's grace. Because they said no thanks. When Jesus came, they said no thanks to the great grace that God showed through Jesus. And so God, who could have done anything, honored their wishes. Never forces anybody to come and follow Jesus. Never does. But the rewards are great for following him. The rewards are fantastic. Israel, Isaiah rather, cries out in verse 27, Concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it's the remnant that will be saved. A whole lot of people, and within that 
large group of people, some will be saved, but some will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have, trem would have resembled Gomorrah. Just puff in the middle of the desert. But what does he do? He reaches out in compassion. He reaches out in grace over and over again. He wasn't obliged, except as he obliged himself, to reach out to the Gentiles. He wasn't obliged to you and me, but he obliged himself through Jesus. Incredible, incredible, compassionate movement of sending his son to this earth. His plan is redemption. His plan is, is mercy. He says, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And who does he want to have mercy on? As many as will come to him. Who will accept his mercy and come by faith to accept his grace. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. How do the Gentiles come into this kingdom that God is offering? By faith. It wasn't, all right, you guys are in. No questions asked. No, 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 it was by faith. Because there were a lot of Gentiles in Paul's day and in the disciples' day that said, no thanks. But there were a lot who came all the way down to us. There were a lot who came. Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith. They thought the law would get them in. A lot of people still do. It ain't going to happen. Tell your friends, it ain't going to happen. That is though it were by works. You can't do enough good works. You just can't. It's not within you to do enough good works because it's not by works but by faith they stumbled over the stumbling stone who's the stumbling stone Jesus and he said many will stumble behold I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who will not believe to those who will not exercise faith it's a stone of offense. But he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Isn't that a great line? He who believes in him will not be disappointed. And that's it. It's just believing the truth. And that's, you remember Paul's opening statement in this section? My heart's desire for my people is that they would be saved. I'd give up my own salvation if they would just come. And he tells them once again here, those who believe will not be disappointed. Anybody here believe in Jesus been disappointed? Raise your hand because I want to talk to you. He doesn't disappoint, but he does call. And he says, come, just come. Come, follow me. And we can walk away. He gives us that right. But what a tragedy if you do. And what great joy if you don't. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you call us to follow you. That you are the stone of stumbling. But you also are the rock of our salvation. So help us, Lord Jesus, to follow you wholeheartedly and completely. And when we stumble, Lord, pick us up and put us back on the trail, we pray. Amen.